And then what we mean by the incarnation is that the eternal son of God, right? So we build on what we've just said, so that God is the one true God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one in, and we use the language of the church. I mean, it, it comes early on through Greek and then over to Latin just simply because of the history of the Roman Empire, right? So Greek is the majority sort of sort of international language of the Roman Empire. Obviously, the Roman Empire encompassed many, many nations or what we consider nations uh, today in terms of the Roman Empire. But Greek was sort of the universal language. And then Latin was the language of of the eastern poor or the western portion of the Roman Empire with Rome. I mean, so they would speak Latin and then eventually went into what we now know today as as Europe. Right. So the Roman Empire went all the way up to to um, into England. And that would have all been Latin speaking. And that's why in Western Christianity, you have a strong emphasis on Latin before, uh, you know, individual nations, you know, are picking up their languages and and, and, and so on. So in the language of the early church, we emphasize that God is one in being or one in nature or one in essence. And there's a variety of words that speak of that, yet he is uh, three in person. And so in the incarnation, we are affirming, uh, and scripture teaches this, we have this in John 1, for instance. So in John 1, verse 1, it begins with, in the beginning was the word and the word is a title that the apostle john uses in the gospel of john and in the letters of john that's the only place that we find this in the new testament uh, where it's a title applied to jesus it's a, a title applied ultimately to the son of god so the the gospel of john makes this very clear so in the beginning is the word and we could say in the beginning was the son the son of god the son in relation to the father in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And that emphasis on with means there's distinction. So the father and the son are not the same. They're the same in terms of their very nature, but they are different. And the language of the church is used as the word person. So they are distinct in person. So the father is the first person. The son is the second person of the being of God or the Godhead. And the spirit is the third person. So the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word, the son is God, was God, right? So he shares the very same one divine nature, yet there's distinction of persons. And then we read a little bit later on in John's gospel, John 1, 14. This word who is from eternity, who is face to face with the father. So there's a distinction yet who is God equal with the father who is God. Uh, the word became flesh. And of course, that's the strongest passage there on the reality of the incarnation. What does it mean that he became flesh? What does John mean by flesh? Flesh just doesn't mean your skin. It doesn't just mean your body. In John, flesh would refer to he became human. Right. So we have to use in scripture, sometimes the apostle Paul can use the word flesh to refer to our humanness, but he can also refer it to our fallenness. Right. That's not how John is using that term. So John, when he says the word became flesh, means he became human. What does it mean for him to become human? Well, he took to himself. So the word who's always, always existed, the eternal word, the eternal son has now taken to himself what we would say a human body and a human soul. That would constitute what it means to be human, right? So each one of us, right, we are a physical, spiritual being in, in whole, right? And we, at death, will see a separation of body and soul, uh, but that's an abnormal state. And then in the resurrection, we are raised to be whole persons or whole individuals again that have a body and soul so when the son of god uh the word becomes flesh he takes to himself a human nature or a human body and a human soul so later on in the history of the church we have the council of chalcedon or chalcedon in 451 that speaks about the incarnation that the son of god took to himself a body and what's called a rational soul right so that's so that's what it means for him to become flesh so that's incarnation he becomes enfleshed, right? He takes to himself a human nature. It's not just a body. It's not just a shell, 
but he takes a body and a soul. So he would have then a human, um, and usually we tie with the soul, a human uh, thinking, human emotion, human will, human ability, right? So the Son of God takes to himself a human body, so he's able to, Luke 2.52, grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. He grows in stature. That means he grows physically. We have in the account of the of the Gospels, right? Two of the Gospels recount for us the conception of Christ. There's the supernatural conception by the Spirit in Mary. Uh, we say the Virgin Mary because she did not, uh, but she was betrothed to Joseph. They were married, but they did not have sexual relations. Matthew and Luke tell us until after Jesus was born. So there's a unique conception of Christ. Luke particularly lays that out where you have the unique coming upon the spirit. So the son of God takes to himself by the agency of the spirit of God, a human body and a human soul. That's the incarnation. And scripture then records, obviously, then the reality of that in the gospels, right? We see Jesus. He grows. He enters into life and ministry uh, at 30 years old. He eats. He sleeps. He gets tired. All of that speaks about a true humanity of Christ. He is also true deity, but we have a true humanity. And it's not reincarnation. Reincarnation would then say, well, uh, he's incarnate, and then he loses that um, human nature. So it's gone off, and then he reestablishes that human nature, right? He becomes now re-enfleshed and maybe uh, some other form, I mean, depending on one's view of reincarnation, but it's not something that happens over and over again. Uh, scripture, I think, makes it very clear that this was a one-time act, right? So that this is utterly unique. You do not have incarnation in the Old Testament. We have appearances of God, but then they're always through created means. There's never an incarnation. The, the Old Testament anticipates the coming of the incarnation, the coming of Emmanuel in Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. You shall name him Emmanuel, God with us. And of course, Matthew picks that up as well. But the incarnation is a one-time event, right? And even in Christ's death, the incarnation is never severed. So there will be a severing of body and soul, but the soul of Christ's human soul was always, always united to the person of the son to the second person of the Godhead, so that he always continued as human. He will continue forever as human. And part of the reason for that in Scripture is that he must uh, take our place. He must do what Adam failed to do. All the way from Genesis 3.15, there's the promise of, a, of another human, a seed of the woman who will come, who will undo the work of sin and death and defeat the power of, of Satan. And, and so the promise of this coming human who is not merely human, he's also the divine son of God, but he must become human. He must keep the covenant for us. He must obey for us. He must live our life. He must die our death. And that incarnation now is permanent. So even now, as he we see this in the book of Acts, right? He's in the end of the gospels, he's raised from the dead. Uh, he then ascends to heaven and he ascends and takes his glorified human nature with him. First Corinthians 15 will say uh, our, our future resurrection will be patterned after his human resurrection body, uh, his human resurrection state. So that tells us that the incarnation is permanent. It's not that he loses that incarnation and then becomes reincarnate again. It's a one time act that is now permanent so that forever he now is truly God, truly human, uh, our Redeemer, who will uh, be the one that we see and dwell with uh, for eternity. So that's something of the incarnation. It's biblical grounding. So all the way from the Gospels, Matthew and Luke are describing the conception. Uh, we see Jesus in his full humanity uh, all the way through the Gospels, all the way through life, death, resurrection, ascension, taking his glorified humanity uh, to heaven with him, and he'll return with that. And the angels say you'll see him uh, publicly return, and of course you'll see him in his humanity, uh, and and that will be a, be not lost, but it's it's that which is permanent. And then our pattern of our salvation is patterned after his glorified humanity, First Corinthians fifteen, and so on. So the incarnation is one time, 
there is no reincarnation. Uh, and uh, that is how the scripture, you know, gives the biblical grounding to this. And it's found obviously in Hebrews chapter two speaks of his incarnation. Philippians chapter two, verses six uh, through uh, nine speaks of him. He used the very nature God assumed uh, our humanity and became human and so on. So the whole New Testament teaches the reality of the incarnation. 